Look at him. Look at him. He's all looking lovely, isn't he? He's ready for us. That's right. I uh, haven't got my kerfuffle merchandise, so I had to go without. This all right. Cool. All right. Stop. Don't go straight in and have a dig within the first two minutes. It's almost That's as what professional. <laughs> Josh, as That's usual, a... as usual, we don't do any sort of uh, foreplay here. We're straight into it, so we will. Uh, so don't swear. Not that I know you would do or anything like that. But are you are you streaming, um, Simon? Uh, oh, I might try. Good morning, Josh. How you doing? Yeah, doing really well. It's uh, fantastic to be here and to be able to spend some time with uh, two of the best in the UK. Two of the best. Come on, that's that's not being very pejorative. You heard it here first, folks. Uh, that's exactly right. We needed to make sure we got it right. So it's all good. So uh, Josh, um, while Simon works out the technical side of um, of streaming and, it, and stuff, we could have be here a while. Um, I'm going to ask you a little bit about your morning routine. Oh yeah, because so one of the but, one of the key things is. It, I just think that like how you start days, how you end it, right? So if you can get a whole level of intensity packed into the beginning of the day, you just have an incredible level of energy and momentum. And, you know, you, um, this is a really important piece of work that um, could be excellent at anything that was written by Tony Schwartz. And in that, he talks that not, not every hour is equal. He said there's a massive difference between, you know, um, the energy in one hour at 9 a.m. and maybe the energy in the hour at 5 p.m. in the afternoon. And so you can't manage time, but you can manage energy. And so one of the most important components is to think about what you're really doing at an energy renewal cycle to significantly get your energy to be able to perform at its best and to be able to get that energy to sustain throughout the course of the day. So um, I've been spending a lot of time in perfecting that for me over the course of the last 15 or so years since I read that piece of work. And the big driver for me is just about that if I don't get it done in the morning, I certainly won't get it done in the afternoon. And I just know that like literally the intensity of these days and particularly during COVID-19, it really does require you to have a, a tremendous amount of energy because of all the things that you're reading, all of the different audio that you're listening to, the podcasts and things and videos that you're watching. There's a lot of new information. And at the same time, too, you need to be rapidly adapting. So morning routine for me is um, about waking up um, you know, pretty early. Um, I like to start as early as I can. Um, and so that means I've got to go to bed early the night before. I try to kick most mornings at about uh, 4.15 to 4.30. I've slightly um, made that a little bit later during COVID-19. I've been having a sleep in. So I aim to get up at about a quarter to five at the moment. Uh, literally, I, I go in, I've got my gym already. I've got a ski erg, um, get 500 metres out on that, get out, go for my run for, for uh, literally 5K, um, come back in, do another ski erg, and then literally just getting ready for the day and just making things happen as, as much as possible. So most mornings I'm here in the office by about 20 past six at the moment, you know, during the COVID-19 era. Um, that's because we're already kicking off events in New Zealand by 7 a.m. our time, which is 9 a.m. New Zealand time. And then we're working through most days through until about maybe um, four or five o'clock I'll finish. And then I'll literally just be doing calls um, from about six o'clock through until 8 p.m. most nights, Monday to Friday. So it's a very um, significant change uh, to what it is that I do because I haven't been on a plane uh, for literally 40 days straight. In fact, I've slept in the same bed for 40 nights in a row after having an illustrious lifestyle of being in a different bed every two to three nights, purely based on where I was geographically training. Um, it has been a really significant change and a big shift to ultimately what it is that we do as a company. Are you missing it, Josh? Are you missing all the, all the travel? Oh, I can't wait. I can't wait. Last time I was in the UK, I remember getting off at a, on a train stop at Derby and um, feeling like I was literally on the on the actual set of Thomas the Tank Engine. So, you know, it, <laughs> it felt particularly uh, back in time. But I, I think um, I'm not missing that. I think that, like, at the end of the day, the goal's always the same, right? What we really are here to do is to inspire estate agents to achieve their potential and to reach financial freedom. And, you know, that goal doesn't shift. It's the method of delivery shifts. And, and when you think about that, if you can connect with the passion of what it is that you do in terms of the core purpose of what a business is, then that really does significantly change the game on, on how you feel about it. You know, and there have been days that I've been exhausted, there's no doubt. There's days that I wonder whether or not I still want to, you know, have an existence of living like this for the next 20 years if this was the only way of staring into a Zoom camera. But what I do know is incredibly important is that it, it's the reward. And we had um, a really amazing thing happen only last week. We were doing some work with an incredible brand um, Harcourts over in Christchurch and um, what they did there which was incredible was is that they we got to the end of the session and there was 800 people on this particular webinar and they said oh Josh can you just stop speaking for a moment I said yeah okay 
till we stopped and the owner said, you know, okay, Josh, we're just going to do something that you probably haven't heard for six or seven weeks. And they got everyone to open up their microphones and got everyone and they'd organized to have this spontaneous applause. And I haven't heard a crowd applause for like five or six weeks because I'm so used to people just shutting down the Zoom call, you know, just, okay, cool, see you later, bang, you know, it's just kind of <laughs> gone. Whereas when you do a live event, and uh, not on an ego level, but there is just um, an incredible sense of fulfillment in, you know, hearing appreciation for, for work well done. And that if you've really put in energy to deliver a great conference or a great training session, there is just that reward and mechanism. Forget the financial side of it. You know, I would probably not be that successful financially if I didn't have someone coming in the background to make sure that all the invoicing goes out for the different things that we do. Because if you can connect to purpose and you can do it well and you can really get that level of appreciation from an audience, that's the thing that gives you the level of energy and the drive to want to do more of it. And I think that that's a really important thing for people to understand is, is that you know, human, human interaction plays a significant role and a significant bearing in the fulfillment and the meaning and the purpose of what it is that you do as an estate agent. And I think that, you know, as soon as we're legally allowed to get back and do viewings and get back in front of clients and to have that, that workforce, that ability to be able to work out of an office and see our friends and family again and, you know, be a part of that, it's going to be a huge change. And this is a industry altering, life altering, significant event that will literally change the entire course of, of, of the human race going forward because, you know, our appreciation, our connectedness, our community, what it is that we're doing to significantly drive and change the way that we do business. There's decades of change that have hap literally happened in weeks here. And this has been a really important time for people to be able to see the future of the industry in a completely different way. You know, certainly in Australia, we've seen the adaption of video tours, what we've been doing in terms of um, vendor meetings, owner meetings, landlord meetings, tenant meetings, Zoom meetings with our entire landlord database, you know, and, and customer base. Like it has been a, a really significant shift. And this is what I want people to think about is, is that, you know, we have become more connected to our communities. Um, our waterways are looking amazing. The environment is actually thriving. We're in a position right now that we are literally working out whether or not we want to be staying at home with our family ever again, you know, at this yeah. point. And I think it's, it's, I think that like that whole Viktor Frankl idea is, is that, you know, we're another day closer to this being done. You know, I've not for one, you know, counted down the number of days. And this has been an issue certainly in the UK and certainly one that I've seen in New Zealand where they, in New Zealand they had a 28 day countdown and I saw people on Instagram, oh, you know, we're at day, day number one, you know, and by the time they got to the end of the week, we're at day number seven. And by the time they got to the end of the day 14, they were like kind of done. And I'm like, don't do that. What Viktor Frankl says in his book in A Man's Search for Meaning is, is that, you must at all times be in a position that you're thinking about what's ahead. And what I've been saying to myself is that I'm another day closer to being able to stand in front of a crowd. I'm another day closer to being able to come and see, you know, Simon and David live in the Kafuffle Podcast Studios <laughs> in London. You know, and, and this is this is the thing that literally drives me in the morning to want to get up. I think that, that one day is possible to be able to go and, and to make that happen. I think that that's that's the thing that you've got to realize is, is that life has been completely reimagined. 90% of the business that I run is illegal right now. And that's because you can't stand in front of a crowd. You can't do an audience. You can't run a live ticketed event. You can't do any of those things. But interesting enough, we have to adapt. We have to pivot. And we pivoted a lot. And, and that pivot has, has made a really huge difference in terms of not only the, the financial success, but most importantly, the success of our clients and the success of the people that get to work inside of my company. And, you know, I'm very proud to say that not a single person in my organization has um, taken a dollar less home throughout the course of COVID-19. Every single person has maintained full employment and they've had full benefits right the way throughout this course of this period. And it is my intention as an employer to absolutely do that until the, until the absolute last moment that we can. And I think it is such an important part in being a great leader. I, I wouldn't be brave, brave enough to tell Kylie she was getting uh, any money less either. So, <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, interesting thing is, I said she was the first to turn around and say to me, "If there's anything that you ever need, if the company needs any extra funds, whatever, um, I'm more than happy. We'd go back and we'd redraw on the mortgage to help you out." How much, and not how that much we even you, needed how that. How much did you take her for? <laughs> no, no. <laughs> and we didn't even. We, we never even needed that. But what I think is that that goes to show the true depth of real human relationships and That's understanding right. your role as a as a leader is is that if people can see that you know that you're finding a way and that you'll do everything to make sure that they're looked after on the way through, 
this builds tremendous amounts of loyalty and you'll never have a recruiting problem again inside of your business. Yeah. And I think that like, this is the important part. A lot of people haven't seen this as the opportunity that it can be. I understand that situations are different, but I can tell you what, I've just paired back lifestyle. I've made some changes. I've pulled some money from different locations. I've got myself in a position where I've changed product and service mix. I've adapted quickly. And what I always say is it took me three or four years to really understand my business model and 10 years to perfect it. In this particular case, it's taken me about eight to nine days to understand my business model. And I, I think um, not being too egotistical, but being in a position, I think it's probably taken me 14 days to perfect it where we're very clear about how the business runs and operates, what our revenue streams are going to be, what our cost mechanisms are, what our profit margin looks like inside of the business, how we're actually helping clients to be highly successful and ultimately keeping on top of what is an incredible amount of um, new information about what's happening in Australia, New Zealand the, um, and the UK um, and the UAE, the four markets that I concentrate on. And then also too, um, the states and the territories here in Australia all have different legislation at this particular point in time about what we can and can't do as an estate agent. And so to be at that cutting edge, the requirement to have that level of knowledge really means you need to focus your time and energy to get the momentum that you deserve. Mm -hmm. I think you um, you just hit the nail on the head there, though, Josh, isn't it? And we've spent a lot of time now talking to people about um, company culture, and you know, it's very easy to put slogans up on the wall uh, and actually then to, to act, you know, to act in not the way that that reinforces. Um, it just makes it totally transparent and feels false. What we've been really been blown away by those people that have had teams respond in the way that you did there, Ryan Wolfenden, who um, is a great agent down here. He's come to uh, a few of your bashes when you've been over. Uh, and he had exactly the same sort of input from his team that yours did. And indeed, one of his guys, young guys, George, said, look, you know, don't pay me a basic at all during all this. I'll just take commission on anything we do. And I think that that kind of... But, you know, that, that brings to fore, doesn't it, more than anything else, the culture that you've got in a business when the chips are down like this. I think the big thing about it is, is that are the chips down? Like, you know, I know that we've got some restrictions and things that are in play, but this is like literally this is getting ready for the rebound. And like if you have not used the last six or so weeks, you know, to really position the business for what happens post, then you're going to be in significant trouble. And I think that this is where the, where the job is, is that we've got these incredible customer bases that sit inside of the database, so to speak that literally people have never called, they've never connected with, and they don't deserve to have them as customers. Whereas ultimately what the best estate agents have done is that they've used this to strengthen relationships to be able to set up for an incredible platform for the bounce back. And this is the, this is the whole key thing. I've never been worried about current performance. I'm not worried about the, this current particular second in time and when, when you know getting that sort of instant gratification. What I'm more focused on is, is that what am I doing today to build my business for its success in 25 years from now? Yeah. And if you start thinking about it from a long-term perspective, you know, I've been running this business for 13 years. If I happen to have a 13-week intermission during the middle of, you know, out of Act 1 and into Act 2, I don't want to bring back a business that's the same size as it was. I want a business double, if not triple the size. And the way that I'm going to do that is I'm thinking about new services and new products and new experiences for my customers because, you know, when the mission and the purpose of a business is so clear, like, literally, you pivot and you make a decision to go there. And this is the amazing thing, like, um, a lot of people don't understand it, but, uh, you know, a lot of people will ask me questions. Oh, you know, your competitor's doing this and your competitor's doing that. And, 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 I, and I say, okay, great, good on them. And I wish them all the success in their life. But I spend not a single second of my life worried about competitors or what they're doing. I spend every single minute of my waking life spending about what I can be doing to significantly help my customer. Because at the end of the day, if you are 100% customer obsessed, you will win this game. And this is important. You know, you've got all of these landlords. How many of your... Um, how many of, the, of our clients in the UK have made the decision to go and do a Zoom webinar like this for every single one of their landlords to talk to them about the process and what they can and can't do as a part of the process? How many of us have got back in front of all of those people in our local communities to talk about what we're doing to support local communities and local businesses as they come back online? But this is the chance where real estate agents are absolutely the fabric of incredible communities. And what they do really well is that they are, they are connectors. They're connectors with people because we deal with one of the most important in Maslow's hierarchy of needs, which is shelter. And when you understand the purpose of what we're dealing, what we know is that the people will be fundamentally impacted by this for literally generations. And what is important to remember is that that will force property transactions. 
there will be an incredible amount of volume that will come out the back of this. Tenants will want to move because they won't want to re-let or renew their existing lease because they'll be able to find better value in other properties that will remain vacant during this period. There'll be people that will want to buy, there'll be people that want to sell, that want to move to the country. Like literally, it's, it's forcing, and, and this is one of the big marketing campaigns we're running in Australia, yeah. is that we've never had this time before where people can re-evaluate Reevaluate not only their relationships, reevaluate their work, reevaluate their home life. Like, you know, if you get into a position that you get to live with your partner at home for the course of 28 days, what they're telling me in New Zealand is that there's one of two choices. Either number one, a baby's due in about eight and a half months, or number two, there's a divorce coming on. And so if you think about that, the foundations of what make the real estate industry run are absolutely amplified by this set of circumstances. And this is the problem is that I don't think that people are taking the opportunity serious enough that this is a chance to reformat the business model. This is a chance to serve customers in new ways. And this is a chance to get rid of some of the old and to literally bring in the use of a high quality prop tech that substantially changes customer experience. And if you do that, you change the game. Yeah. Josh, last time we spoke, um, you, you're talking about shelter now, but last time we spoke, we were talking about the um, Australian bushfires. You told us a story about a friend of yours that literally mm. just had the t-shirt on his back and he was sleeping um i think in a caravan out the back of his office how's he doing mm -hmm. i so worry he's doing about really that well guy. um no no he's doing really well now you don't need to be worried at all it's actually his birthday yesterday um interesting conversation the insurance company has come to the party and he's actually got the money sitting in the bank they've paid fully out um and now they're in a position that they're looking to build a new home and he goes it, it just feels so bizarre to be in a rental property that the insurance company is paying for and being in a position I've got money in the bank to go and build a new house. So, you know, that's one of the great lessons about re-emergence and about the recovery. And this is what I want people to think about is, is that this is a health crisis that turned into an economic crisis that is soon to turn into a trade war. And, you know, like I'm going to say, if, if, if you think about what's happening in the UK, dare I mention the word Brexit, but I think about this whole conversation, this pandemic is going to make Brexit look like an absolute drop in the ocean. Well, Josh, and I think that it'll, you know it'll literally allow reformation. It's, yeah. it's essentially us preparing for Brexit. This is, <laughs> this is just a dry run. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and I think that that's certainly the case because this is going to force a lot of localization, the movement away from globalization, the movement into nationalism. You know, there'll be a whole range of things like that. And in Australia, our government's come out and said very clearly that we want the recovery to be led by um, small business. We want the recovery to be led by the local shop owners. We want the recovery to be led by that. And, you know, certainly that's an intention that as soon as we have the opportunity to um, be able to re resume some of our normal services in our business, you know, we'll be putting people on. I have no doubt about that. And I think that this is it. What, what we did in our business model was really interesting is that, you know, I, I think it took us a week too much, too long to pivot. But one of the conversations that I had is I said, I want to assume that not another pound of traditional income comes into this business from this point forward. What are we going to do to go and serve that customer in new ways, in new product lines, new service lines, to achieve the end objective, the purpose of what we're here to do as a company? And when you start thinking that way, it forces you to think really differently about, you know, what can you do as a part of this process? And I think that that's the really empowering thought is that most people go into this negative spiral about all the things that they can't do. Can't go to a restaurant, can't leave my house, can't go out, can't do a viewing, can't do videos, can't do this. But what you can do is connect with customer base. What you can do is connect with your team. What you can do is to get ready for the rebound. And to me, that's the exciting proposition of what it is that we're doing. Like, you know, I only remember that maybe three years ago, Simon and Whale and I were at my house and we we're talking about recording a podcast. And only maybe this time last year, we were in uh, uh, Seattle and we we're talking about recording a podcast. And someone's like, oh, it's too hard. I don't know if we'll ever get there. Now he's like literally produced more podcasts than anyone on the entire face of the earth. And I'm going to need about literally four weeks off to permanently listen it's, it's to the surprised us all. podcast content. Yeah. It didn't surprise so, me because I know that as soon as someone gave him a microphone, it was going to go off. So there wasn't okay. going to be any problems there. So, so let me just, uh, uh, as we said, we, we, we are, our issues with Facebook are many and numbered. You'll notice we're not actually streaming live to uh, Facebook at the moment, but we are recording, by the way, to do this. 
just to let you know just how special we are, I got the message back as we started to stream it live. Your message couldn't be sent because it includes content that other people on Facebook have reported as abusive. <laughs> so I did see what you did with the Star Wars uh, animation, and I do agree. With that. <laughs> so that's how, that's how edgy we are, Josh. We are already Zuckerberg sees us as a threat. Well, what, what, yeah. what we're going to do is we will um, pretend that this is going out live later, right? Mm -hmm. And, and re-release re it as a premiere. So, J Josh, for those that don't know your background, I mean, I've attended some of your seminars and, and they are phenomenal. I, I find them, but they, they sort of re-energize agents. I look around the room, there were a lot of tired faces there early in the morning and you challenge them just to keep going and to keep sort of asking themselves, uh, better questions, I suppose. Um, where did the property journey start with you? Why property? How did you get into the industry? Where did it all begin? Oh, so this is such a great, um, such a simple story. You know, my dad was in a position in a regional country town. Um, he's got nine brothers and sisters. They literally, um, they got in a car, they left Sydney and they went as far as the fuel tank in the car would go and they ended up in a little place called Albury, which is a little regional city. And when they got there, my grandfather was actually a white goods salesman. He used to sell door-to-door -door fridges. And one day the guy that he was selling a fridge to said, you'd be better to sell where these fridges go. I said, what do you mean? He goes, well, the house. He goes, oh, well, I can sell houses. And so he literally went and started the first ever vegan estate agency back in 1972. My dad joined in the same year in 72 as a real estate agent, as did all of his brothers. And so they literally became uh, this massive force in that particular market at that particular point in time. Uh, by the time that things got to about 1980 or so, there was a conversation, you know, typical sitting around the boardroom. Uh, my grandfather said, who would like to go and open in the office in the next, uh, the next location? And no one put up their hands. So he looked at my dad and he said, well, look, your, your name's Brian. You're the first in the alphabet. You can go. So it was very advanced business planning. Um, as a part of that, dad went across and started his, his business. And uh, literally, um, when I was born in 1982, my dad was already a real estate agent. Prior to that, he was a builder in the construction industry, building residential homes. And the interesting conversation, you know, as a young child, I just became fascinated with it. I would wake up, you know, at four or five um, in the morning. And, you know, just because I was sleepless, I didn't know that was an actual thing. And I'd wander out and at 5, 5, 5.30 in the morning, I would see my dad there um, sitting uh, by a desk and he would be reading or he'd be listening to either Zig Ziglar or Brian Tracy or, you know, some of the absolute greats um, of the American motivation scene back in those days. And it was on cassette. Uh, cassette, that was a tape type device where you could fast forward to get to the start of side B. Um, literally, interesting conversations is that dad would be listening to that and as a, Young child, mum and dad had a you know a bit of a bit of an argument one day, and mum said you're not spending enough time with the kids, and dad said well I'll fix that. So he got me a little suit and said well you're going to come out, and so I went and started doing <laughs> viewings and inspections on properties and, and how uh, literally old collecting were you then? rent. Six years old. So wow. we'd go and collect rent on Sundays <laughs> from tenants that hadn't paid. We would do auctions as you call them in the UK. Uh, we'd do open for inspections and. Uh, literally, um, I didn't know that that wasn't a thing. And so from age six right the way through to probably 16 or so, um, every Saturday I'd go and work with dad doing open houses and auctions and being inside of the, the real estate scene. And most days if I got picked up from school, if I wasn't catching the bus home, I'd go to the office and lick envelopes, particularly at the end of, uh, end of the month for all the statements for all of the landlords. And I can still taste those envelopes many years on. Um, so the, the journey into property wasn't a natural one. Um, I did like property. I, my dad hated me for it. By the time I was 18, I absolutely wanted to buy my first house. I think the moment that I became 18, I did buy my first house with mum with and dad stopped back in the day. But literally, I got my name on a title and it was a great little house and I still own that property today. And it's been an incredible journey because... Um, lots of different things happened. I worked in newspapers, I worked as an accountant, I worked as a DJ, I ran nightclubs. Um, I've done lots of things. I had my own go-kart racing team at one point in time. I joined a circus for three days. Um, but then literally I got myself into a position that uh, one day my dad rang me and he said, hey, do you want to go to the Australasian Real Estate Conference, which was held by John McGrath? I said, oh, well, look, I'm, you know, I'm on my way driving back down from Brisbane after I was leaving the circus. He, I said, oh, I might as well go and have a look at that. So I went to that conference and Literally, I remember walking in there and there was just that feeling, the emotion, you know, the amazing, you know, the, the music, the big sound, the speakers, the lighting, you know, just is like walking Aaron, into something. Is that we know it today? Yeah. 
Yeah. Arik, yeah. So we, we, when I went to Arik for that first ever time, it's the first time I'd ever seen anything like that before. You know, I, I think back in those days, it was probably about 1,500 or 2,000 people. And, you know, John McGrath got up and spoke and I found him quite inspirational at the time. And there were some amazing speakers that were there, and including guys like Bob Wolf out of the United States. And, and I just thought, you know what, wow, this is absolutely amazing. And I, I became hooked on sales. And, and what I worked out is, is that I naturally, over time, I'd initially thought that I had some sort of form of depression. And this was an interesting thing when I was a DJ in that um, I was, you know, when you're in a small community and there's not much going on, I had a very active brain. And, and the problem is it was a Ferrari engine for a brain, but it had bicycle brakes. And so I had to try to figure out how to stop it. And so that's why I started doing the DJing on Friday nights. And one day I just worked out that like literally um, I've got an addictive personality. And so what I wanted to become addicted to is I wanted to become addicted to helping people to be successful and I want to become addicted to you know running because these things if I could run somewhere I could see the world if I could be in a position that I could help other people achieve their potential the the feeling like the chemical feeling that just goes off in your brain knowing that you've given a piece of advice that has helped someone to be successful in an area that they weren't is probably one of the most rewarding feelings that you'll ever get and I think that you know whether or not that's um uh, evident or whether or not it's not what I think is important is is that you just got to keep on doing it and you know, I, I see that literally if, if, if today was the last day that I was here on earth, I would literally tell you that there is not a minute of every day over the course of the last 13 years in running this business that it has not been an absolutely thrilling ride. It has been absolutely amazing. It's been incredible. The clients that I've got to work with, the people that I've got to meet, the experiences I've got to have, have been absolutely astounding. And I think that this is the whole thing is, is that a life becomes the way that it's lived. And if you live with intention and if you live with purpose and you live with capability and if you live with the desire to be of service to others, then ultimately you put yourself into a position that life fundamentally changes for you. And to me, like literally the driver here is about getting passionate about what it is that you do and being able to show that passion in a way that uplifting people. And I see that inside of my own team. You know, the people that join my business are certainly not the people that leave. And I, and I say that very proudly because I don't want anyone to ever work for me and, and be stagnant. Uh, you know, if you're going to join a personal development company, you need to personally develop. So, Josh, you, you, we spoke about Facebook before. Um, and mm. Mark Zuckerberg famously wears the same thing every day. Last mm -hmm. time we met, you were wearing exactly the same thing. In fact, here's a yeah. picture of you with your lookalike um, brother, Oliver James, another fan of the show. Um, yeah. How does that work for you? Do you literally open up that wardrobe? There's a million Josh Vegan suits there. You put on the Josh Vegan mask and go out to work. How does it go? Well, it, it's an interesting thing. Um, I was actually working with Alexander Phillips, the number one real estate agent in Australia. Um, and, you know, he's a phenomenal, uh, phenomenal agent. He's become a very good friend. And, uh, you know, we've done a lot of work together. And when I first started in the real estate training business, I thought I had to stand out. I had the big pinstripe suits. I had the tie. Back then I had hair, it was quite spiky, you know, all of those things. And it was interesting enough, he said to me, he goes, I'm going to say one thing to you. I said, what's that? He goes, every year Dior and Chanel have the same, um, have the same suit available and it's always in a, in a dark navy. So from that point of view, what I'm going to tell you is that you don't need to stand out, you need to fit in, you need to make people feel like they're just like you. And he said, that's the number one thing that you should do. Get rid of the pinstripes, get rid of the tie, shave your head and get yourself into a position that you get into a blue suit and a white shirt and you'll be phenomenally successful. So I followed Alex's advice. Um, I've got a tailor that looks after my suits for me. He hates me. Every year I go back in, I order my three, four or five suits, whatever it is, and says, same color. I'm like, yep. Same white shirts, yep. And we don't have to do any, any measurement, uh, any changes to the measurements. And I think that this is the important thing. It's easy to grow a business and also substantially grow yourself. What you've got to do is you've got to make sure that you're looking after yourself and that you're super fit because your fitness is your ability to be able to respond to the situation. And, you know, we handle a ton of stress, you know, and a ton of, you know, different complexities as we go to work in those four different markets around the world. So the last thing I wanted to do was to use a decision up on what sort of tie I should wear or what colour it should be. So I just made the decision that navy suits and white shirts would be the way. Um, and literally with the haircut, it's been very easy. I'm, I'm down to under a couple of seconds a day and getting it prepared. You've been rocking your quarantine haircut for weeks, right? Yeah, that's exactly right. And my barber's one of the best. He doesn't talk much and gets it done quickly, you know. So that's, that's quickly really, do it at that's time, really so. important, isn't it? If there's a list of things, I think they do it in Uber, don't they, where you can specify, do I want the person to talk to me? Just shut up. I don't, I, I don't have any interest. There's a couple of things I took from that, Josh, as usual, being the 
uh, being the strict journo that I am. First of all, the idea of you as a mini me uh, at that age, running around, uh, being a, a real estate agent, just is, is fantastic. There's got to be, somebody needs to take the rights to that movie and get that done. And then secondly, my life is not going to be complete with it bucket list style without going to a nightclub that you own with you DJing on set. That's, we're, we're setting that up as a kerfuffle exclusive at some stage in the future. Oh, yeah, there's, there's probably no doubt. I just think that, like, you know, um, the thing about it is, though, is, is that, like, if you have a diverse life, it gives you experience. And a lot of people don't make that decision to go and create a diverse life. And I think that, like, you know, you, you actually do have the opportunity to do that, but you've just got to make, make that decision to get out there and to make it happen one day at a time. And the more that you can do that, you know, the quicker that this business grows. And that's where I think that a lot of people go wrong is they, they don't create opportunity out of what is directly in front of them. And in terms of um, coming out of this crisis, because again, it, it, or opportunity, it's it's going to it's going to end. We're going to get back to business in a new world, perhaps operating in a new way. Um, a lot of people have spent this time learning. They've spent this time sort of listening to new things and 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 so on. With there's also a lot of agents that we've spoken to are having a bit of a crisis at the moment. They're not mm -hmm. sure whether they've fallen out of love with an agency uh, or mm -hmm. with an industry, and uh, they need reinvigorating. What's what's sort of the the key thing they should be focusing on? Well, I think the big thing is is that to you know like uh, this is not easy for anyone. You know, don't don't make it don't make it feel. I don't want to make it feel that like you know we've just got it nailed and it's too easy. I think that the reality of it is is that. What we are doing is, is that, you know, staying very, very future focused. And the more that you can stay future focused, the better. Um, what I've always found that for me is, is that when I'm thinking about me, I'm at my worst. When I'm thinking about how I help others, I'm at my best. So I wouldn't spend too much time in, in quiet reflection about, you know, you as an individual and where you're at. I would actually be in a position that I'd, I'd, I'd start to have some better quality conversations about what you can be doing and, and where things can be going. And, you know, this is a terrific industry. It's the only chance that you get to be able to work with people and have really good quality conversations and to do that on a regular and consistent basis. And I think that the lesson is, is that, you know, it's about positioning yourself in front of great people that like literally do allow you to go and build some really significant results. And I think that like, you know, when you think about the lessons of where it can go and, and what it is that you can go and do, then that really does, you know, kind of change a, a lot of the outcomes. Um, one thing I was just quickly pulling up for you now, this is a true photo um, of me when I first started inside of the real estate industry. Um, have a look here, this is with my dad and um, Danny, the guy from the local pizza restaurant. Just have a quick look at the haircut there. Um, that was uh, even more extreme than one Simon Wales. Um, in addition to that, in terms of the community piece, I used to auction at the local school, with, you know, just as a natural part of it. There was the extra one where I was back out, you know, uh, doing auction days. And also, too, at a social proof level, you know, using that to, to really be a massive part of, you know, what it is that you did inside of the industry and past clients, you know, being out there. This was before the blue suit days. It was the big tie days. You can see how badly the shirts were fitting and the, and the suits were fitting back in those <laughs> days. But it gives you an idea that, you know, I, I think that when, you're a, a, when you are a practitioner, it changes the way that you feel about things. And what I'd be saying to you is, is that don't spend too much time about worrying about now. Instead, get really future focused and get a plan like you've got to get a plan and that's the most important part for anyone today it's like you know i know that we can't travel overseas i know that we can't go on holidays i know we can't leave our homes i know that we're probably not going to be able to do many of the things that we would always love to do but there is there's a really important thing there's a way that a start agency was done before this thing turned up there's a way that a start agency is being done right now around the emergency component and then there's certainly a way that a start agency will be done and this is a whole conversation is that be a part of the future yeah. and see that as an opportunity. And so this is where I'd be getting better mentors around you, you know, better quality conversations with people, looking to leaders in our industry that are doing some amazing things, you know, joining all of the podcasts and, and having some really good quality conversations, but do some reading and create a future because if this is my last day on earth and the way that I have to live it is in the middle of a pandemic, I don't want to die depressed. I want to um, die. I want to die in a position that I'm excited for the future that is ahead. And people are naturally attracted to that energy. Like either you've got the energy and the vitality. Like, you know, interesting enough, um, I, whenever I go into situations, like I often get some really good feedback. And I, I have this mentor that is particularly interesting. And he said to me, Josh, I'm going to tell you that there are two things that make you unique as a human being. And you need to know this. 
And I said to him, what is it? He said, well, the number one thing is, is, is that people are naturally attracted to the way that you think. Never lose that. He said, the second thing that people are naturally attracted to is the energy that you bring to the table. Never lose that. And that's never left me because I always think that like literally what people ultimately buy from me if they, if they become a customer is the, is the energy and the way that I think. And this is an interesting thing because in our business model, we maybe used to have to create content, you know, maybe every 21 days we have to come up with something new, find an angle, find a way. Right now, we're developing content every 21 hours. Yeah. And so the speed and the innovation um, that that is requiring is absolutely immense. Does it take its toll? Absolutely it does. But what I can tell you, we will never be the same out of this. No. And we will come back better and bigger. Josh, can I just ask? I mean, I think everyone's obviously, look, it was absolutely important beforehand video. Uh, you just put, you put on a really an amazing event the other night with some of the best speakers, obviously a, an entire digital event and, and all the rest mm -hmm. of it. Some people are reimagining it. What do you think the limitation of video is, though? Is there is in your head is there a limitation, or um, you know where does it where does it stop? Oh, absolutely, there is. The jokes don't land on video <laughs> because you don't get the laughter, and if you do, it's delayed. And to a comic, that feels like death. So um, me, and, me and David, me and David are used to that experience. To be Josh, do you, do you do you consider yourself like a comic where you need that kind of sort of audience rapport where you you're getting a oh yeah you yeah. feed on energy like i've been in front of audiences where i feel like i'm death warmed up and you know i'm giving it everything and you know they're lucky to be able to open their eyes and i and i think that this is an important conversation is is that i, I so one of the things that carly says to me is that after every event that i do she says do you want to go back okay. and if i say i don't want to go back we just don't go back you know, oh, okay. we just don't follow that client up. We just don't go back there. And I think that this is such an important part. That, is that, that that's life like is really precious. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's true. But um, life is really precious. So spend it with people that you know are going to go and do something with it. And, you know, so the, the, the terrible things that happen in the training industry is that when someone says, I've heard that before. Mm. Well, you know, there's the Ming Wang Yang quote, which he says, to, to know and not to do is to not know at all. And the type of cultures that we thrive in are learn-it-all cultures, not know-it-all cultures. And this is the whole problem is that when someone it develops an, oh, I know that, I already know that, okay, great. Well, then why aren't you doing something with it? Because, like, and this is the, the biggest problem, and I was saying this to one of my clients in the UK only last night. I said to him, look, you know, you've got a business of about 2,000 or so properties under management. I said, this is your chance. We can get this thing out to 5,000 within the course of the next 18 months. He says, how, how are you so confident about that? I said, Talk to me about your competitors. He goes, well, I've been into the office. And one of the things I noticed is that they have not even been no, into their offices no. in the course of the last six weeks to take away all of the mail that's been coming through the front door. What's the likelihood that they've been doing emergency maintenance? What's the likelihood that they've been proactive in front of their customer base? Like there are entire power shifts happening here that businesses would, are not guaranteed the market share that they had before they entered into the pandemic. And this is the wake up call is that this is where new businesses are being built that will literally be double and triple the size of what they were beforehand because they're, they're adapting in a much faster way. And the adaption skills is where it's at. Like, you know, you've got to be out there and get energetic about what that future business plan is and how you're going to go and help customers. How frustrated do you get, Josh? I mean, I, I assume on one level you don't because it keeps you in business. But you, you're quite right. You've been coming over now for, is it over a decade over, over here to the UK? It, it'll be nearly a decade. It'll be yeah, pretty okay. close. Yeah. And clearly you uh, you almost claimed the whole, uh, the idea of prospecting. I know some of the best agents were doing it, but really you were reinforcing it. And yet you, you're right, time and time again, you came back and on the face of it, it wasn't particularly rocket science. Talk to your past clients, or as you always correct us, their clients. You know, mm -hmm. and, and yet still, it, the percentage of people, I would say, that mechanised prospecting is a tiny percentage in the UK. What, what do you say to that? I mean, is it just endemic? Oh, it's awesome. And, and, and it's an incredible thing because the fact that a couple of percent got it, fantastic. Well, that means that we've made momentum happen. <laughs> and, and I don't focus on the negative. I focus on the positive side of this is that sometimes people need to hear things 14 times before they hear it for the first time. And it's about this decision about how deep and engaged you go with it. And like literally, you know, um, one of the things that I'm really careful to want to do, and you know, one of my great mentors, Peter Nye, who you know very well, 
yeah. always says to me, he says, Josh, keep on working at creating a beautiful mind. You know, a mind that has dexterity, the ability to be able to think, that can be exposed to new ideas. And he says, you know, you're far too science-based. You need to be a bit more art-based. And so I dabble in the arts a bit to be able to, you know, be able to open me up a little. And I think that what is important is, is that your lesson here is, is that um, I don't judge my success based on that. What I judge is that when I find a client that goes ridiculously deep and does amazing work out of it, and literally, you know, Peter Knight has been very good at, at being able to facilitate that and some of the amazing relationships, you know, um, people like Mark Ross at Red Brick, um, Spencer Lawrence at Paramount, you know, what it is that we've done with, um, with Lucy and Lee Pendleton at Pendleton's. Like, you know, some of these people are making the decision to go really deep into what it is that we do as a company. And the more that they do that, the bigger the payoffs. And this is the problem is that there are too many people shopping religions. There are too many people shopping trainers. You know, like literally choose one and go all in. And I think that this is the most important part is, is that you can't keep on looking at all these religions. You have to choose your faith and be a part of that. And I think that, that you know, if you believe in, in, in doing prospecting that way, great. But if you leave in doing prospecting my way, then come do it. Because I know that we, without a doubt, produce the highest profitable estate agents and the most highest profitable estate agencies in the world. Because that's the customer base that I aim to work with. And I don't say that lightly. I know for a fact that we produce it because there won't be hardly any of our customers that won't exist post the pandemic. What do, you remember, do you remember when we did the, you came up and did a fantastic day for Manning Stainton and Mark Manning? Oh, yes. yes and, yeah. and I was determined that I was going to be obviously the center of attention. So you always describe that it fits into the, the audience, the, the breakdown into fairly equal thirds. There's the third that will find any excuse. They will say, you know, mm -hmm. oh, I can't get a phone signal. I haven't got my mm. CRM data. You've got a third then that actually, they don't feel so natural, but they get on with it. And there's a third that just go at it. And I was determined to embarrass the, the, the ones who were doing it. So I ran off with a little copy of, uh, of Repit on my, on my PC, as you would know it. And I went out and in the break, when you were doing the prospecting, I went and did a number of calls because I thought I'm going to walk back in. I'm going to say I've got two uh, two appraisals just as the software tech guy. The thing was, I thought, I know it a bit better than Josh, so I'll, I'll change the script a little bit. <laughs> and so that whole point you made about you, if you're going to throw yourself in, do it and do it as I say it rather than you know trying to trying to create your own thing before you even know anything is really important isn't it? I, I was probably a bit prescriptive back in those days and hopefully i've matured and hopefully i've grown up since then and one of the things that i would say is, is that you know there's point a and you want to get to point b and the problem is is that i know how to get you there and i know how to do it quickly but a lot of people are literally off taking yeah. the long country road route to try to get there and just before they get there they literally enter the death loop and they die and this is the whole problem is, is that like the lesson is, is that you know if you follow any of Ray Dalio's work from principles, what Dalio is always about is, is that, you know, literally you've got to have clear clarity, goal, system, outcome. Yeah. And if you're not getting the, the result that you want, you got to go and change the system. And so if you're not getting the outcome, you've got to say, okay, do we need to redesign the system or do we re need to change the people that are working the system? And this is such an important point is, is that in business today, when you find the system, you work it. And like, I mean, to say, people would say to me, oh, Josh, you're boring. Your business is boring. Everything you do is boring because you've been doing the same thing for 13 years straight. No, no, I found a system that produces outcome and now I work it. And, you know, this is an interesting thing. Like most people would say, oh, you know, your life looks so spontaneous. You get to travel. No, no, no. I'm in the UK the same week every year. Every year I come in, I walk in, I'm going to Wimbledon. You know, that's, that's usually the case. And when I get to October, it's always for Peter Knight's imaginary birthday, which happens to be around when the EA Masters is on. And what I think the lesson is, is that like, this thing is planned within an inch of its life. That's the biggest adaption I've had to make, where I can't plan for more than maybe a week, maybe two weeks ahead. And that's debilitating. Because when you can do it for 18 months in advance, like I've got 100,000 worth of uh, flights that are, you know, flight credits with Emirates and Qantas and Virgin Australia because I just can't fly and they've had to refund me because I'd booked all of my flights a year in advance. Yeah. So like literally when you start operating like that, and I, but you know what, I, I, I turn that powerfully into a positive and say, you know what I can do? I can work the next two weeks. I can be a part of that. And when Simon came and said, hey, would you like to be on the Kerfuffle podcast? I didn't, I didn't like even for a minute, didn't even worry. Yep, yeah, bang, I'll sign up, I'll do that because I know how much he's done for me in opening up the UK 
and it would just be something to try to help and support him on the way through. So as for you, Mincy, we've still got a few things to work out. But I think that the, the lesson is here is that you know, you've got to have fun with it and you've got to be in a position that you help and that you support people as much as you can. What you just mentioned there, all the credits, one of the things that I've been sobbing around uh, when I have my mental breakdowns is we missed out on the Blue Sky uh, event, which you mm -hmm. do every year with Peter Knight, you mentioned before. Mm -hmm number of the best agents from the UK, um, mm -hmm. Spencer, Spencer, Charles Robinson, fantastic agents, number of your agents in Australia as well, all get together in a different location and discuss challenges um, there. This year was meant to be customer service a bit or the customer experience. Peter Knight mm -hmm. spoke about it to some degree now, obviously, in terms of the 4X uh, style thing. Do you mind mm. just talking to us what, what we were going to be learning and what other people have the opportunity oh, to learn? So unfortunately, Simon, that's all in the vault, which will need to be for a further podcast. No, uh, the reality <laughs> of it is, is that um, I think that, like, you know, Pete said it best, you know, CX1 was all about available goods and services. CX2 was about, you know, being in a position that, um, you know, you could go and make things happen. And that was where brand and marketing really changed things. CX3 was the evolution of globalization. And CX4 was about, in, was about, enablement you know so the customer ultimately buys a product or service because of what it enables them to do now if you listen to tom peters um you know he's had some great speeches including the reimagined speech he says that the ceo of harley davidson came out and said that there is not a single person inside of our organization that's silly enough to believe that what we actually sell is motorbikes what we sell is the ability for a 43 year old single white male to dress up in black leather and ride to any small country town and actually think that people are afraid of him and and and, and you know I, I say that because you know, I think that this is such an important point is, is that the enablement piece, you know, what do you actually do? What's the enablement piece? And like literally, if I can make one person's life a little bit easier, if I can help someone to breathe a little bit better, if I can be in a position that I can help them be just that little bit more successful in business, then literally I will lie on the field victorious, you know, bleeding in battle, knowing that like literally I've died in a worthy cause. And I think that that's such an important point is, is that, you know, you've got to have some goddamn passion and conviction about what it is that you want to achieve as a human being. We're here for a very short period of time. This pandemic is literally just a, a small blip in what is an incredible life for all of us. And we need to learn how to be able to form what it is that we want to have out there in the front. And that's where goals are really important. So you talk about, you talk about having a plan, but that goal, mm. finding that goal, as a, does it need to be a singular thing that you're looking to try and achieve? Everybody oh, hell no. No. No, hell no. One of the big things I think about, you know, I've got a health goal, I've got a travel goal, I've got a relationship goal, I've got, you know, um, all sorts of things that you want to go think about. And, you know, and what I think is important is, is that you've got to find one thing that literally gets you up out of bed in the morning. You know, I, I knew this morning that today was going to be a great day. Do you know how I knew that? Because when I woke up this morning, that's the first thing I thought of. Today is going to be a great day. And it's the day that I, and it's the thing that I think about every day. You know, um, I actually have on my alarm that when my alarm clock goes off, it says fit, driven, happy, and energetic. And they're the first words that I read at the start of every day. Fit, driven, happy, energetic. I go, oh, yeah, yeah, fit, driven, happy, energetic. And then the next alarm that goes off five minutes later says sneakers first. Oh, shit, yeah, I've got to go put the sneakers on. And once I put the sneakers on, oh, I better go for a run. You know, and this morning, you know, that little devil voice came in. Yo, know, it's raining outside. Can you hear that? It's going to be wet. It's going, it's going to be to cold. Change. There's a change of seasons into Australia. We're moving into our winter shortly. And I thought, oh, can't go. And I thought, you've got all the wet weather gear. Go put it on. And I went and put it on and I did my ski erg and I went out and I started running. And you know what? Not a single other person was out. Mm -hmm. And that just absolutely proved to me there is no competitors in this space. And that's what Tom Peters always says is that, you know, when you're the best, there's no competition. And if you just have that view of what's it going to take, you know, what, does, what does a seriously good estate agent actually do? And, and this is such a great question because I don't know if you guys have been watching the Michael Jordan um, you know, uh, documentary that's been out on Netflix, but if it's out in the UK, you should definitely watch it, um, The Last Dance. And it's awesome because he just says, what does a seriously good basketballer do? They train, they play the ball hard, they get it in the hoop. That's all they do. What does a seriously good estate agent do? They work with buyers. They work with sellers. They work with landlords. They work with tenants. They find the way around the obstructions of the day, the issues, the challenges. And like literally the estate agency industry is filled with some of the greatest problem solvers in human history. And our ability to solve problems fast, to learn, act, decide, 
Like those models are the things that ultimately shift the entire momentum. So what are you learning from this pandemic? How are you going to act differently? You know, what are you deciding now is massively important for the business. And if you learn, decide, act, you know, then this is what we're seeing. There, there are businesses here that will create competitive advantages that I genuinely believe competitors will take a year, two, three years to catch up to because they're just not mentally switched on to the availability of what's happening in prop tech. But most importantly, what's happening to customer experience design. Like who would have thought that our parents would be all over Zoom? Like literally eight weeks ago, if I'd have told you that, I would have told you were dreaming. Now we're in a position that literally we've got the daily whale, which seems to happen every so often. You know, but it's the, it's the secret <laughs> and the consistency <laughs> that drives the success in business. Oh, Josh. David, I think that's my 20 pounds that you wanted <laughs> yeah. to uh, give me for getting into whale about that <laughs> consistency. Yeah. You mentioned. I like this guy. He is my favorite yeah, yeah, of all the others. You two have been like talking him. offline. Josh, we've got, um, we're really pleased. We've got Marcus Ciminello on, obviously, of Marshall White fame um, yes and it chimes um both in terms of i want to ask you about what great agents do but we have got a question you'll know kai logan from bradley's um over mm -hmm. here yeah and he asked the question is now the time to really get on top of our databases sorry databases with a view to coming out with a far leaner but more engaged and motivated active database now obviously marcus is famous isn't he for having a very very tight uh, you know, not having thousands and thousands of people in your database and shouting and bragging about it. But he took, a, took the view that it should be kept down to the bare minimum where he can live, breathe and understand every one of those buyers. And indeed, I'm going to be really careful here in my answer because I think that there is um, a, a, a misunderstanding about what this actually means. Um, I don't actually fundamentally agree about having a smaller database. Okay. I am actually uh, all about, um, and I think that Marcus and I will agree on this point, you need to know what your, who your customers are in that customer base and you need to work those really well. So sitting inside of any business for it to be really truly successful, Seth Godin will say, who are your 1,000 real true fans? Yeah. Like who's the core customers that spend all the money, that do all of the work, that make it all happen? And I know that inside of my business I've probably got maybe 50 like really core customers that are absolutely essential to the overall you know, existence of the business. But having said that, in the digital world, where you can really track the digital intent of customers, as soon as you get the email address, mm. you're in a position that you understand exactly what that customer is doing in the digital world, so then you can work out what's happening in this online world and who's about to move into the transaction in the offline world. And so I don't want to get that confused. I think that what is really important is that size and database as big as it can be around meaningful data. And the conversation is, is that learning how to use that digital intent of customer to then work out who's going to be in the offline world. So I believe that what Marcus is really talking about is the offline customers, the people that are really doing transactions, as opposed to the thousands of people that are over here. And so you need to be very careful about that language because I, I, I think that my lesson is, is that, you know, I might have, 20,000 people on my, on my database, yep. but yet at the end of the day, who are the five, six, seven, eight thousand 8,000 people who actually do read the email every day? So that's and those about, seven or 8,000 are more valuable. That's about management then, isn't it, Josh? That's a really interesting discussion Absolutely. there. It's about, you know, quite yeah, well, how many phone calls can you literally have in a day? You can't do the 20,000, but actually technology yeah. should be should be delivering a consistent message. You joked about the Daily Whaley, and that, that's a state agency right there, isn't it? We're going to do a monthly newsletter. Your first newsletter has 47 articles in it. Your next one has 12. By month three, you're trying to come up with stories about the office dog or something like that. And, and, and so, so here's the lesson, Simon, is it's about scale. Yeah. So is what I'm doing today scalable, and can I stay consistent? And so what we've always done inside of our business is that we just build some incredible layers, and you know, I think that like, okay, great, daily email, weekly coaching tip, add a podcast, growth leadership and management tip, yeah. quick question Tuesdays on Instagram. Like that's when we started and we built that and we, we built consistency and then we leveled up. We built consistency and then we leveled up and people try to bite off too much. So what I would say to you is, is that you need to actually understand what your data plan is and you need to understand what your marketing plan is I don't add someone to my database unless they're actually going to be a prospective customer and that I've qualified them. Mm. And so that's absolutely the job is that, you know, it's a completely different discussion and we could go on for hours. But the lesson is I don't think it's about trimming the database. I think it is about understanding 
Why did that customer come to you in the first place? What is the real problem that they're actually trying to solve? Do they still have an appetite to solve that problem today? And even if they don't have an appetite to solve it today, mate, COVID-20, when that comes out, like who knows, that might cause a whole new range of problems. There's, there's, so a, sequel, just, there's a sequel that everyone's looking for, isn't it? The return oh, it just of COVID. feels so last year. Like, I don't know. And at the end of the day, like it's certainly not the 2020 vision I had when I was um, getting ready at, at New Year's yeah. Eve last year, I can tell you. Yeah. Um, Josh, the future of the industry, where do you see it? I mean, we've touched on it in terms of there, but what, what, uh, what long-term uh, trends, changes do you think there will be? But, you know, the interesting thing is, is that we all talk about the future of the industry and where it's going, what the customer says that they just want to be served, how they were served before. Yeah. Yeah, like I'm going to say, for all of the talk, who's actually got 20 customers into a Zoom meeting and asked them what they want to see estate agents do into the future? Yeah. You're asking the wrong people. The industry should be trying to decide where it goes the industry should be connecting deeper with its existing customer base and finding out what are real customer problems that actually fundamentally need solving um, where do i see the industry going i think that you are going to see the rise and rise and rise of high quality estate agents that fundamentally know exactly what it is that they're doing yeah. you know when you get a chance and as i know you guys do and you get to sit in front of someone like a dale norton or, dale norton or a peter rollings and peter rollings and i've got a uh, i've had a very good relationship you know in terms of mentorship and one of the things whenever he mentors me is, is that I just, I come out of that call, I come out of that Zoom meeting, I come out of that meeting with him wanting to play this game at a higher level. And that's where I think that like, that that's the advancement of any industry. And I think that it's the conversation is about how do you push an industry forward? You be an extremist, you go to the edge. You know, and I think that people are fighting the wrong battles. And, and you know, dare I say it, I know that Rightmove have, have, have done some interesting things over in your marketplace and have certainly copped it. But what I would say to you is, is that what a lot of people forget is, is that um, it is core and they had first mover advantage. Yeah. And at the end of the day, I can't cut that off if that is the number one lead source for tenants and number one lead source for buyers. And so like, it's crazy to go on this ego argument when the reality of it is that if it delivers results, yeah. that's what you're actually in the business yeah. of. You're in the business of getting a result for your landlord. You're in a business of getting a result for the seller. And I, 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 I know I'm controversial, but I'm in a position that I've received nothing but incredible support from Rightmove during this period. And I, I know that they messed it up, but they got it right, I think, in the end. So you'd be trying to just put that argument to bed, get the best deal that oh, you can do, and move on. Shut, shut up and move on. The customer doesn't understand. Yeah. What the customer wants is that they want to let a property. The customer wants to buy a property. Let's get back into the facilitation of the job that we actually get done. And I think that, like, you know, the lesson is you can argue about portals all you want, but I can tell you what's happened here in Australia a significant shift to off-market. And those off-market properties, nearly representative of 20, sometimes even 30% of the current listing stock available on market right now is actually in the off-market platforms on the real estate agency's websites. So learn that the content that customers want is things that they can't get on the portals. And this is where it's been fundamentally driven in the off-market platforms. And so I'm just playing a different game. My game is about building towards quality content that forces people to want to be in that database because you've got something of value as opposed to sending out one of your 47 articles about how to wear your kapapal cap. <laughs> and are, are you, it's O'Brien. <laughs> the ultimately, customers will go where the properties are. So in, in terms of mm -hmm. if you've got those on your own website and you've got them on a, a system like um, Rightmove, um, they'll follow the content. Absolutely. And I think the lesson is, is that like literally if you've got it on your website and you've got it available as off market, then people will see that and go for that. And the, the lesson is this, is that like um, what you need to understand is that what is the one thing that the customer really wants? They want access before everyone else. Everyone wants to be a part of the VIP club. Everyone wants to get access prior. And I think that if you do that, then that changes things fundamentally. So do you actually understand the strategy that you're trying to drive to get the outcome that you want? And I think that like, you know, whilst I understand that, you know, people don't always behave well, I think that the lesson is, is a very important part look after the customer you know and as we, we come to the close in our conversation today i think it's massively important that people are 100 percent customer obsessed you know the small businesses are the ones that get impacted here you know people ask the small businesses for the discount i tell you what mate you go to amazon.com who hosts my website there's nowhere to go and ask them for a discount for the hosting yeah. they've copped full fee right the way throughout the course of this period and that and they're big companies that make massive amounts but yet it's the small businesses that are, that are expected to take the full brunt on this but what we're doing here in Australia is that we are for small businesses and small businesses will lead us out of this situation because they're the heart and soul of our communities and our villages and they really do make this whole thing sing. 
I think that's a really important point about, you know, if there's one thing we're going to learn, isn't it? Those off market confidentials, you know, somebody asked the, the, on the Facebook page about your opinion on virtual viewings, but from what you're saying there, you see that as a, as a key tenant in the launch process, isn't it? You know, that's mm -hmm. absolutely scale one of the tools forwards. Yeah. So Josh, one, uh, okay. We are, and thank you as ever for your time, um, helping to keep us our little podcast going. Um, Obviously, we're really pleased today that we're uh, over the next few days, we're setting you up on the Kapopal website. So people will be able to catch up with all of your uh, all of your um, all of your events, all of your things like that. We're obviously going to want to shout about you from the hilltops. Um, do you want to just give people an overview of how they can uh, engage with you, get this sort of um, this this sort of experience with your digital offering? Oh, well, at the end of the day, Simon, the best thing that someone can do, if you've got a problem or a challenge, just reach out. Hit us up on Instagram, send us an email, go to the website. Um, we've got live chat on the website. We're here to help. Um, I just want to make sure that every single estate agent that I come into contact with comes out of this crisis. If you get a moment where you feel that you're in isolation, if you get a moment of challenge, we're here to help and we're here to support. And, you know, certainly when it's appropriate for us to be a part of that, we'd love to be able to assist. And one day I plan to be able to come back home to the motherland and to spend some time and potentially even have a beer with you in the great land that is the now UK. Talking, talking. An, hour, an hour of foreplay and we get to the important point. That's great, Josh. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's quite quick for you. Yeah. <laughs> Thank, you. That's Thank you. Thank you, Josh, for your, for your, your words of inspiration and, uh, yeah, and, and support as ever. Yeah, I think it's been a privilege and a, and a pleasure. And I think that, you know, um, you, you're, you're certainly very humble when you say that it's just this small little podcast. This thing has become an absolute beast, the uh, Kafafel podcast. So um, I wish you continued success. I will be taking several weeks off to be able to listen to every single one of the episodes. Uh, but I do uh, certainly wish you continued success. And if there's anything that we can do to help you um, yeah. here at the Josh Feeding Company, certainly for any of your listeners or for yourself, we're here to be um, to support the industry, and we do that in four different countries: in the UK, in New Zealand, in Australia, and certainly the UAE. And we will continue to do that whilst I'm graced with presence on the earth. So, thank you so much for to be a part of it today. Yeah, thank well, you. It's not about being a purple cow; it's about being a pink uh, pink pony. So, you take care. Stay safe, Josh. Cheers, mate. Sounds good. <laughs>